Okay, let's begin everybody. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today for the basic steps to starting a business webinar. My name is Christopher Garcia and I'm the business development specialist at the SBDC at UNM Valencia campus. And today with me is Leslie Everson. She is uh, my wizard in the background and she will help you all if you have any technical difficulties. We created this webinar off of a great document on our website called the basic steps to starting a business. And the bones of this presentation were put, were put together by my former director, Wayne Abraham. And we do miss him here in our service area. My contact information is on the slide and a PDF of the slides will be emailed to you following the presentation. So don't worry if you miss anything. Before we begin, let's go over some webinar ground rules. Everyone on the call right now is muted, so don't worry about background noise. There is a feature to raise your hand and I'll use it throughout the webinar to make sure everything's flowing, to ask you questions, make sure uh, I haven't lost anybody. So in fact, right now, any everybody who could hear me and see me and is good to go for the rest of the webinar, I'm gonna open up my participants. Would you raise your hand for me? I know we have one online, uh, one phone caller. So at the end of the presentation, I will allow you to speak if you have any questions. Very good, you guys are doing good. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And remember to include the number of the slide at the and they're all at the bottom of the slide. So everybody on the call right now, just so we make sure you know how to use your Q&A, can you send me a hi, hello, how you doing? <laughs> Perfect, and I see some some people chatted over. If you're having a, a problem that uh, you don't wanna address in the Q&A, please put it in the chat and Leslie, our wizard in the background, will be able to answer those chats. But if you have a question about the slides, I would really appreciate it if you put it in the Q&A because we keep track of that Q&A and it, when we answer a question, um, it shows us what time we answered it if we have to review it again. So I see all of you are zooming like pros. I'm not gonna have a problem with any of you today. Okay, perfect. So here's a graphic of our center locations through New Mexico. The mission of the SBDC is to build skilled entrepreneurs and strong businesses by offering no cost confidential business consulting and lower no cost training events like this one. I'm going to tell you more about the SBDC in the next few slides. On this slide, you might notice the SBA disclaimer at the bottom. The SBDC is funded by the SBA. We aren't the SBA, uh, but they are a major uh, funder for us along with the state of New Mexico. So this is your tax dollars at work. So we're, I'm so glad you're taking advantage of this today. This, slides, this slide includes three topics for upcoming trainings basic steps, QuickBooks Online. We're planning those in April and October, and that's with our, our lovely center director at the Clovis Community College, Sandra, uh, Dr. Sandra Taylor Sawyer. We're in the midst of our cybersecurity six-part series, and at the end of the presentation, Leslie Everson is always great with uh, giving us great um, upcoming webinars. If you have a question about our webinars, want to see all of our listing, please visit the nmsbdc.org website and our full listing is always available there. Here is the agenda for today's training. I'm going to tell you more about the SBDC, talk to you about our pre and post surveys for this training, get into the basic steps, review and demonstrate our excellent research tools, then take questions in the Q&A of course. I'll also have uh, you raise your hands throughout the presentation, so please participate. In fact, I wanna see where everybody's from just because I like to uh, see how many people I'm reaching. So if you are from central New Mexico where I'm located, please raise your hand. So that's uh, from Bernalillo to Belen. Let's see how many of you are here. Most of my uh, attendees are usually from the Albuquerque metro area. Oh, I don't have that many this time, very good. We're getting out there throughout the state. Let's see how many of you are here from um, 
northeast. So Clayton, Tucumcari, Eagle's Nest. Oh, you guys are probably, you're probably chill to the bone up there in the mountains or in the plains. Oof. Okay, I see one. How about south, uh, northwest, Farmington, um, Cortez, areas like that. Oh, there you are, Christy. There we are. I see a few. Wow, I love, I love that area. It's so beautiful, but I bet you're cold too. Let's see, how about Southwest? So we're thinking Silver City, Deming, the Boot Hill, they call that area. Oh, good, I have some from, uh, from that area, great. I don't think I've had anybody from that area yet. Perfect, and how about um, Southeast? So we're thinking Carlsbad, Lovington, Hobbs. Well, we're gonna to have to get some from down there. I don't see any quite yet. Well, thank you for participating in that. And that's what some of the questions I'll ask throughout the presentation. Now let's talk about the services of the SBDC. We offer two major services, the confidential business consul consulting and the lower no cost business trainings. Uh, we've been so um, fortunate this year to get some uh, COVID from some money, government funding for some COVID related trainings like this one. So those are all free. So take advantage of those while they're hot. There are no limits to how much no cost counseling you can receive. And we have centers throughout New Mexico. So there'll be one close to you. And if you look at the upper right hand corner, we have a cool little graphic there that shows what we uh, strive to do. We strive to renew, grow, launch and start up small businesses. So if that's what you're aiming to do, we're here to help you. This slide shows what we expect from our clients. My fellow business advisors and center directors want you to succeed. So you'll be assigned homework or further research. So please do the work necessary to succeed. We can't make decisions for you or offer tax or legal advice. We can only connect you to the information you need to make an educated decision. And part of making an educated decision is working with licensed professionals like attorneys and accountants to obtain the best advice. So I want to see by a raise of hands, how many of you work with an attorney or an accountant right now? Oh, good. I have some smarties on the line today. Perfect. And I'm guessing the rest of you need those uh, resources, so we're going to provide you with them today. Next, I want to remind you about important surveys we send out as part of attending these trainings. Everyone who registered for this webinar received an email from uh, Leslie Everson saying, in anticipation for, of the upcoming uh, basic steps to starting a business in New Mexico event that you have registered for, we would like to collect some preliminary information from you. With this information in hand, we can tailor the course material to better fit your needs. That's an exact quote from the email, by the way. So I want to do a poll. How many of you receive, or not a poll, but a raise of hands. How many of you received the pre-workshop um, survey? Oh, very good. I see about half of you raised your hand. So the other half of you, you guys better do that survey for me, please, because it's part of our funding. And we want to make sure we're funded for more of these great webinars. At the end of this uh, webinar, you'll receive a post survey, probably tomorrow or the next day, and it'll be a review of this webinar. So, you know, uh, I'm thinking happy thoughts for those. Please do both. And the slide, the slide also has my email address at the bottom. You could either email me or Leslie Everson, and we'll be happy to send you that survey if you didn't receive it. But it's usually it usually goes into my junk folder or my clutter folder. So please retrieve that from that folder if you have one of those. Very good. Now let's talk about starting a business in New Mexico. Before going into business, there are some important considerations you must think about. Will I make enough money to live? Will this replace my current income? Do I need the benefits offered by my current employer? And these are things like retirement plans, medical insurance, dental insurance, vision insurance, 
In fact, I'm, I was, uh, I have to go for my vision exam on April 1st, disability insurance, life insurance, and other important benefits. Can you replace those benefits by starting your business? You must also think about your educational background and skills. Do you have the correct educational background and skills to understand and operate the many facets of a business? This includes bookkeeping, accounting, human resources, supply chain management, my least favorite, sales, and that's just to name a few. If not, you may need to hire somebody to perform those tasks or obtain further training. And as a test of, of where you're at as an entrepreneur, we have this test your potential as an entrepreneur doc document on our website. And the links to everything I talk about will go out to you in the follow-up email. So don't worry if you miss it. And uh, this just gives you an idea. And if you're working with a business advisor or a center director, it'll give them a better idea of where you might um, have challenges as a business owner. And it's a survey and it's about every, and, and it also goes over almost everything you need to think about when starting a business like a startup budget, some topics to think about like OSHA, uh, if you're in construction or, or physical labor, it's identifying some startup ideas, feasibility analysis, which is one of my favorite things to do just because I'm a pessimist. Estimate, uh, there's the startup cost right there. And this go, this document goes on and on and I'll let you look at that on the on the website if you're interested. But it's very important to get that, that down so you could take some of the trainings we have to offer. We're, we're doing something like almost 100 trainings a month, I think. So uh, take advantage. Now let's go through the steps to starting a business one by one. These slides will be emailed to all attendees, so don't worry about writing down web addresses. And step one is defining the business. This is the who, what, when, where, and why, and how. And these questions are answered in a business plan. And if you need a business loan, you must provide the lender with a business plan. There's no two ways about it. Also, if you're gonna apply for some of the grant funding out there, maybe you wanna apply for one of the um, New Mexico Economic Development Department's tax credits, you'll have to prepare a business plan with financial projections. Many centers use a fill in the blank template that I'll email to you after this presentation, but there are many options for creating a business plan like online software such as LivePlan. SBA.gov has a great training with worksheets on how to write a business plan. I actually took that training as part of my professional development it took me way more than the 45 minutes that they said it was going to take, but it was very helpful. And we have more tools available at nmsbdc.org. I also want to point you towards the New Mexico Economic Development Department one-stop website, and that's the gonm.biz. And this website is a partnership between New Mexico agencies that you must contact when starting a business and the New Mexico Economic Development Department. And I find it to be one of the most helpful websites the state has to offer, other than the SBDC, of course. So I want to show you the basic steps of starting a business handout. This is on our website, and it's a link that will go out to you with this presentation. And it's the 13 step, the lucky number 13 steps we'll talk about today. And this is basically an outline of that. And then on part two is a listing of New Mexico state agencies you may need to contact as part of starting or operating your business. And then here's the gonm.biz website. And this website's packed with information. It's, it's, it's a, a treasure trove of info. So I wanna show you the um, on the line right now where you could go right away to see these tax credits. And that's under business development. And here, see what it says, NMEDD programs for business. The job training incentive program is a, a program available to those manufacturing businesses who wanna train their employees. And then as you go through EDD employ and programs for businesses, you could see that there's JTIP now, there's some international trade, there's some finance development, and under finance development is where you you'll find those economic development programs that are most commonly heard about on the news and through the SBA like LIDA. And I always forget what LIDA stands for, so that's the It does not tell us what we stand for, but they help uh, people who want to come into New Mexico make a significant community impact, create jobs, and they mostly uh, provide funds to a community for that business that's going into that community. 
uh, and it's a reimbursement type uh, uh, program. And uh, it's usually for something like manufacturing. The, so for example, Lita was given to the Facebook data center here in Los Unas. I believe the Lita funds were used for the Ketter uh, plastic injection molding plant in Berlin. And they're just funds to support uh, either a business relocating or expanding in the state of New Mexico. Uh, another great one for you guys on the call today, I'm, I'm assuming many of you have not started your business yet, is the Collateral Assistance Program. And this program helps those who want to take out a business loan but may not have the collateral they need for that loan. So oftentimes banks will ask for between 10 and 20% collateral on a loan. So if you were taking out a $500,000 loan, it might, be, it might be hard to come up with that $50,000 you need. So if you have 30, they might come match you with 10. And that's part of the um, former governor's plan for economic development. And I think it's really good. Another great one I wanna tell you about is the opportunity zones because this represents a big opportunity for people in New Mexico and those coming into New Mexico. So they have an online hub and what opportunity zones are, they're zones designated by um, those who create economic development in the state as zones of low economic development, but high potential. So for example, downtown Albuquerque, a lot of downtown Albuquerque is an economic uh, hub uh, opportunity zone. The wet, far west side and the far east side of Los Unas are opportunity zones. Uh, there's, uh, it's not by coincidence, Facebook bought land in an opportunity zone. And you're able to raise money from richy riches, you know, so rich, rich, well, wealthy people or wealthy corporations that have capital gains. Instead of paying capital gains tax to the IRS, they could use that money to set up an opportunity fund and fund your business as an investment in that opportunity zone. And those are mainly geared towards manufacturing type businesses. So if you're interested in those, um, I think that's probably some of the best information I could share with you today. And you could contact me. And if you have a question about opportunity zones, I love talking about them. So put it in the Q&A and I'll go further into that at the end. Okay, here we are at step two. Step two is choose a business name. And there are legal considerations when choosing a business name. And it's very important to find a name that resonates with your target market or markets. Looks good on a website, social media, and business cards and other marketing material. Is easy to spell and pronounce and isn't trademarked or copywritten by another business. And let me, this is one of my favorite examples. For example, there was a restaurant in Albuquerque called D's Cheesecake Factory. And if you grew up in Albuquerque, this was probably one of your favorite places for lunch or a sweet treat. And I don't wait in lines very well. I would wait in line for some of this cheesecake whenever I would go to Albuquerque. The owners of these Cheesecake Factories started the business after World War II and trademarked the name of the state of New Mexico. That's a trademark of the name D's Cheesecake Factory. Fast forward to 10 years ago, about 2010, 2011, there's a national chain called the Cheesecake Factory. And if you watch the Big Bang Theory, you might know uh, one of the lead characters works there. And they want to do business in New Mexico, but they could not operate a restaurant with the phrase Cheesecake Factory in the name because the savvy business owners at these reserved the business name many years before. In this example, the small business had the upper hand, but you can imagine how a small business operating under a trademark business name can end up being sued, have to change their business name and all that expensive marketing material, and it might actually destroy a new business that could have a lawsuit. There are two types of trademarks. There's the state and the federal. The first website on the screen is for the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, you, you use us, use PASTO, as most people call it. Not me, I call it the USPTO. <coughs> and the second is for the New Mexico Secretary of State's Office. <coughs> These are the two agencies responsible for registering trademarks. And since we can't provide legal advice, it's important for you to consult an attorney before making a decision on a business name. I'll show you some great resources later in the presentation, including, including the newest member of the SBDC team, the Technology Commercialization Accelerator at New Mexico Tech, staffed by Estefanita Rawlings. And um, I think next month she is actually going to do two webinars for us, one on um, patents and one on trademarks, and we'll gain more insights into that. 
Uh, but you could imagine the payday that the Beast Cheesecake Factory, that I, I remember the dad ran it forever and then he, he passed away and then the children inherited it. And they probably didn't want to push cheesecake the rest of their lives. So they probably took a big payday from, from uh, that national chain. Step three is choosing and registering your legal structure. Um, the legal structure of your business is its foundation and must be carefully considered um, because that's how you're going to operate your business. The common business structures are on the slide. Everything but sole proprietorships must be registered with the New Mexico, New Mexico Secretary of State's office and the paperwork is available online. They have an excellent website. Maggie Toulouse Oliver is our, uh, our uh, Secretary of State and she's done a great job. More information about legal structures can be found in the document called Basic Steps of Basics of Choosing a Business Entity. And I'll show you that website right now. It's put together by an attorney. So it gives you that legal advice you might crave. You could also reach out to our resource partners. Um, one that pops to mind is um, SCORE, the Service Corps of Retired Executives. And they may have a retired attorney or somebody who can give you uh, more legal insights on the accountant and attorney. And it goes into the liability you're under as a business owner. And they give you the pros and cons of each business entity. As you notice here, that it says DBA or doing business as. Unlike other states in the United States, we don't have a formal DBA registration process. The only place you will register a DBA, and this is more most common for sole proprietors, is when you register your business with your municipality or your county. And then I put a little link here, here to the B corporations. B corporations are a new type of corporate structure. Um, Towski Valley, I want to say, was the first B Corp, one of the first B Corps in the United States, and they're not offered everywhere. B Corp stands for Benefits Corporation, and it's those corporations. I like to use the example of Tom's Shoes. So Tom's Shoes were big when I was in college, and they're the ugliest shoes in the world, but I wore them. And whenever you buy a pair of Tom's shoes, they give a pair of shoes to a child in Africa. So that's, the, that's an example of a benefits corporation. And if you want to learn more, there's that link on the slides for you. They don't work for everybody, but they're, they're something to consider. Now, now that we're having fun with talking about all this paperwork, let's talk about step four. Obtain your federal employer identification number um, or FEIN or EIN number, tax identification number sometimes called. This is the unique identification number issued to your business by the IRS and is used on all federal filings. So that's tax returns, whatnot. If you're, and it's also the number they use to track it. You, you use to track and pay your, your employment taxes. If you're a sole proprietor, your social security number is commonly used instead of an EIN, but most banks or uh, credit unions require you get an EIN before you open a business bank account. This number is just as important as your social security number and should be protected as such. There's more fraud with EIN numbers than there are with social security numbers. And you, I'm sure all of you on the call know how rampant fraud is with social security numbers. No matter what business entity you choose, it's a good idea to obtain this number and it's required for banking purposes. And you could use it on a, um, other things like um, some of the, the business structure paperwork you might do. Continuing with our paperwork requirements, step five is to register with the New Mexico Taxation and Revenue Department to obtain a CRS ID. This is CRS ID, tax ID, TAP ID, referred to as a lot of different things. You might be wondering what a CRS ID is used for and why you need it. Well, let me give you the fancy language. It's a unique identifying number used by the New Mexico Taxation and Revenue Department to record and track your business's collection and payment of gross receipts tax. If GRT or gross receipts tax is a new term for you, you might recognize it as a tax to pay whenever you buy goods or services in New Mexico. It's usually around 8% and shows up at the bottom of your receipt. The online registration form is free to complete, but you may want to seek the advice of a CPA when completing the application. 
I know a lot of people go to CPAs to do their CRS number for them, and then they don't know how to log into the system themselves. So it's very good for you to, even if you work with a, a tax uh, preparer or a CPA, to know what your login information is to pay your gross receipts tax because they could hold you a little bit of hostage there. You, you file this on a quarterly, bi-yearly schedule. You get to pick it, and then once you start making more money, they'll, they'll probably make you pay monthly. Therefore, the department offers a great online training, and here's the link at the bottom here, no cost intro to GRT. I'm actually attending the training on the 23rd, I wanna say is when it is. Let's see here. Yeah, I'm gonna be there on the 23rd. So if you'd like to join me, please, please register for that uh, webinar here. And it, you could ask your tax question straight to, to the horse, get it straight from the horse's mouth about new, the new business presentation. And then the, there's the new employer's presentation. So please consider which one you want to take. And, and if anybody on the call right now is going to start a business, just take this. It's a must. Nothing more entertaining than learning about gross receipts, right? <laughs> Step six is to obtain your local business license and other applicable licenses. When doing business in New Mexico, you need a business license in the municipality or county where you have a physical presence. For instance, Teofilo's restaurant has a physical presence in Los Unas, so they get a village of Los Unas business license. If they had a food truck and did business in Belen, they would have to obtain a temporary or full business license in the city of Belen. If they were just outside of Belen, the Valencia County, they'd have to get one in Valencia County. If they wanted to go to Albuquerque, they'd have to get one in Albuquerque. And some of you might be thinking that you'll do business online or in another state. This means getting a business license in any place where you'll physically conduct commerce. And if, if you talk to an accountant or a tax professional, they refer to this as a business nexus. And that's how they, uh, they figure out where you have to pay taxes and how much it's gonna be. So check with, uh, let's see. Each municipality or county has a different requirement for obtaining a business license. So check with your municipal or, or county office uh, or consult an attorney for further advice. So let me give you an example. The, the city of Rio Communities asks you to sketch a floor plan for, floor plan for your business. And that's even if you're a home-based business, they just want you to sketch a floor plan. And that's one of their, the requirements created by their um, Economic Development Council. And the Socorro County doesn't have a formal business licensing process. They just have a letter on their website that says, if you do business in Socorro County, you don't need a business license. And uh, of course, the more rural you're, the area you're gonna do business in is, the less requirements they may have. If you're in Albuquerque, you're probably gonna have the most requirements if you're in Farmington, Las Cruces. And you can't obtain a business license unless you have that gross receipts tax ID number. So remember that it works in the steps. So first, Secretary of State's office, EIN, gross receipts tax ID, then you could get your municipal or county license. And remember that, that the Secretary of State registration for your corporation is what sets the foundation for all of this. And it's also how you get taxed. Step seven is to report new hires to the uh, New Mexico directory. This is a pretty dry and straightforward task. The link to the directory is on the slide, it's the first link, but this brings up human resource considerations. Human resources is a very important part of any business and comes with many legal and accounting considerations. You can always contact an accountant or an attorney for specific information, but I included links to two good resources for learning more about employment procedures and laws. Our partners at ComplyRight, they, um, uh, fund the America's Small Business Development Conference, have a great blog with lots of resources for small business owners, and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has a learning center website for small businesses. So let me show you ComplyRight. I talked about ComplyRight in the last webinar, and they are a great resource for those of you wanting to get some legal advice but may not have the funds to see an attorney, and they have a knowledge center here and they just go over some of the hot topics in human resources. Politics in the workplace. 
And they offer these on demand and um, throughout each month they, offer, they usually have two webinars that they offer. So they're worth taking. And then the EEOC, which um, if you are an employer and you, somebody feels that you've discriminated them against them based on the um, color, creed, national origin, color, um, pregnancy, status, they will go to the Equal, Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. They will raise their complaint with them and then you'll, they'll probably receive a right to sue letter and you, your butt will be in court. So make sure you take a look at the Small Business Resource Center. A pinch of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And uh, just take a look at what you're being governed by because the more you know, the better it is for you. Keeping with the HR trend, step eight is if you have employees, you may need to complete form ES802. This is a required form from the New Mexico Department of Workforce Solutions or Connections. And the Department of Workforce Solutions has many services, tax credits, and learning opportunities for small business owners. So I include their business outreach website on the slide. Some common services of the Department of Workforce Solutions include job postings, pre-employment pre screening, so these are like typing tests, and in some cases provide space to conduct interviews, and they do that here in Valencia County. So here's that form you need to require right there that you need to fill out there if you're an employer. And here's their business outreach website. Let me close some of this stuff. And I like to just talk a little bit about those tax credits that you might receive from them or some of the more better opportunities they have. So they have an apprenticeship program. Uh, if you're a small business and you wanna bring in an intern from say YDI, they have both adults and young people who need job training skills. They'll, they'll pay the cost of that intern for you in most cases. They help people write des job descriptions. They have hiring incentives. So if you wanna hire some, a lot of my tradespeople on the line, a lot of my retail outlets, my um, restaurants, you might hire somebody and they might have a criminal record. So if maybe somebody has a felony larceny charge in their past and you wanna hire them as a cashier, yeah, you, everybody deserves a second chance. And they and to make it more enticing for you to hire somebody with a record like that, they will provide a bond for you. So if anything happens, uh, they'll cover the cost of that. Another great one is they have the WIOA program. Don't ask me what WIOA stands for, but it help, it's a training program to help get people into the workforce. So maybe you're a trucking company and you want to hire somebody and low, somebody who's without a job and in the low income category, which if you don't have a job, that's probably where you're at. Um, they could get free uh, learning resources. They could get their CDL for free and then go work for you. And uh, that's a, a service provided by the state of New Mexico. So take advantage of it. Okay. Step nine is if you have employees, seek the assistance of an accountant because payroll is a bear, let me tell you. You can see all the tax acronyms on the slide, FUDA, SUDA, FIT, SIP, FICA. And if you aren't willing and able to deal with them, please seek out a bookkeeper and accountant. The IRS website has a wealth of information about your federal tax obligations. And my favorite is their uh, small business taxes webinar. It's, I think it's uh, business taxes, the virtual webinar is what it's called. Small Business Taxes, a virtual webinar. And I might do this as a your small business and taxes webinar one day and, and do it as a guided instructor led class. But if you're a new, if you're new to small business and you're not gonna have employees, take lessons one through four. And if you are an employer or you're gonna be an employer, take the whole, uh, take all nine lessons. It's a must, it's free for you. The IRS wants to make sure you know what your federal tax obligation is. And they put the, 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 there's a little bit of overacting in the webinar, but it's really great. It, it, it's what all the information you get from sitting down with an, an accountant for an hour. So take advantage of that. And this is also available on the Small Business and Taxes um, Resource Center for the for the IRS. 
and I will email you that link in the follow-up email. So this is another must. Step 10 is to seek the assistance of an attorney. So we talked about the important legal landmines in starting a business and operating your business and attorneys are licensed to answer those questions. And I wanna show you some links that I have there at the bottom. So if you're looking for an attorney or you need an attorney, you could go to the New Mexico Bar Attorney Directory. New Mexico Bar, yeah, Attorney Directory, I think I said that right. And it's an online database and it allows you to look for attorneys in your area. So county, let's say we wanna, it's harder to find them in small counties. So let's go to Socorro County. And then we could uh, choose by selection. Business law is one you, you uh, might want to use. Employment and labor law, if you have any employment disputes. Uh, tax, intellectual property right there for patents and trademarks. Taxation. And those are probably the ones you'll usually use most as a small business owner. So let's look for business law. And we don't have any in Socorro County, so we could always go to the next biggest county near us is Bernalillo. And then here we could see a list of attorneys who practice in business law in that county. And you could go into their profile and you could see some of them have fancy profiles. They probably pay somebody to put a picture up or something. Uh, but it gives you all their practice areas, wheels. And when you're starting a business, estate planning is usually goes along with that. And then you have their phone numbers. Another service of the New Mexico Bar Association, let me go to, back to my slides, is the referral service. So if you wanna work with an attorney, but you're just stressed out, you don't wanna go through the database and try to pick one, you could pay $35 to the New Mexico Bar Association. They will connect you with an attorney who practices in the area you're seeking, and then they'll give you a 30 minute consultation. So I think that's a great way to find an attorney, especially if you, you know, you're in a situation where you're stressed out. Let's go back to our slides. And then I mentioned um, with patents and trademarks, we have the, in the state of New Mexico, we have the Patent and Trademark Resource Center, and that's staffed by David Irvin. And David is very knowledgeable on how to find that backup documentation for patents and trademarks. Um, he, so the funding comes straight from the patent, uh, the United States Patent and Trademark um, Office. And this is the Patent and Trademark Librarian for the whole state of New Mexico. And if you wanna, you know, maybe you wanna, maybe you've invented something and you wanna see if there's a patent on it, he could show you how to research that. If you have a trademark and you wanna research some, uh, maybe a trademark phrase or name, he could help you research that. And he works closely with our new member of the SBDC, Estefanita Rawlings. And I will show you her uh, contact information at the end of the slideshow, but she helps people with the same exact thing through New Mexico Tech and she is part of the Small Business Development Centers. Step 11 is to review the guidelines for compliance with the Americans with Disability Act. This is another legal landmine for small businesses and should be carefully considered. Uh, you know, there's attorneys and people who make a living off of suing just based on these ADA laws. And a lot of small businesses especially those who open up in an older building. I like to think of, we have a great store in the south of Berlin called uh, Bethlehem Trading Post. It's a really, really old house and they may not have the ramps, the bathroom facilities they need for um, most people, but they do and they have a ramp in there. And here's a, a publication put together by the ADA and they have a primer for small businesses. Uh, remember a pinch of prevention is worth a pound of cure when you're dealing with legal issues. So if you're going into a small business, especially if you have a storefront, uh, take a look at that. Gosh, I whipped through these steps today. We're gonna have a lot of time for Q&A, so I hope you guys have a lot of questions. Step 12 is to establish a business bank account. It's a best practice to keep your personal and business finances separate. And this makes your bookkeeping process easier and will help you if you have a um, business, if your business experiences an audit. Uh, 
And there's different types of audits. You could get a federal tax audit. You could get a state tax audit. You could get a gross receipts tax audit. And for those of you who don't uh, pay gross receipts tax, remember, you still have to file your zeros uh, or you have to file the, the amounts that aren't taxable. And if you don't, it's a $5 fee and that will eventually spark a tax audit. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, has a great learning module for small business owners called FDIC Money Smart for Small Business. And I wanna show you that link because if there's anything you wanna learn about business banking uh, today, you wanna learn it from the FDIC for sure. But it's a free learning module, banking services available for small businesses. That's a must. I would say take the whole thing if you have time. Um, I'm in the process of working with um, some of our center directors so that we could get this done as an instructor-led course, uh, as a webinar, but you're welcome to visit this website and take each module at your own pace. Insurance is also a great one, tax planning, but the, the best one that I've seen in this whole module is the banking services because they are drastically different than personal banking services and they could make or break the growth of your business. Let's move on. Gosh, we're already on lucky step number 13. Final step, step 13, is have adequate business insurance coverage. This, this slide shows the common types of insurance coverage, property liability, business interruption, errors and omissions, uh, life, health, disability. I recommend you research your options with an independent insurance broker. Oftentimes, independent insurance brokers sell insurances from many different companies and tend to be less biased when they're getting you a quote. They also tend to be small businesses, so it's great to support those uh, fellow small business owners. You can learn more about business insurance by visiting the link on the slide. It's for Hitchcock's Insurance Company's blog. Hitchcock's is uh, the largest insu business insurer in the United States. So they don't need your money, they'll take it, but they don't necessarily need it, but they wanna provide you with all these resources. And it's a link uh, specifically for the small business development centers. And they give you some le learning opportunities for free, give you a, a primer on how to buy business insurance, what business insurance is, what you might need. So take a look at that. That's, that's a, a very cool resource specifically for our clients. The, um, okay. And if you need a list of independent insurance brokers, reach out to your local SBDC um, director or um, advisor, and we'll be able to pull one of those for you. And I might do an example of that in our learning tools or, or our uh, research tools later in the presentation. Well, just speaking of later in the presentation, here's our research tools for business planning. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about them and then I'll demonstrate some of the, the my favorite ones for you. Now that we covered all 13 steps to starting a business, I wanna share with you some research tools that we use to gain insights into industry analysis, market research, demographics, and traffic counts. These data tools are very, very, oh, I even raised my voice on that, very important to the success of your business because they help you fill in the business plan, make informed decisions, and plan for the future. Your business is a big investment, so you better treat it as such. Big investment of your time and money. The first link is a great 30-minute webinar. For, so the first four are free. These are things that you could access. And then the bottom, the ones at the bottom in bold are things that you have access to as SBDC clients and their paid databases. So the first link is a great 30-minute webinar from the SBA's website on how to write a business plan. And they also provide great worksheets and examples of financial uh, statements and projections. The second link is for bplans.com by Palo Alto Software. This website provides you with numerous business plan examples. And they used to sell these business plans in a disc back in the day. Um, and it was kind of pricey. Now they offer all their business plan examples for free because of course they have that business planning software called Life Plan. It's a great alternative. If you're tech savvy and, and you wanna to put together a business plan, life plan's pretty neat. Uh, if, you want, if you're old school, if you're like me, you like to do a written plan, I will email you the business plan that we use at the SBDC. The third link is for Census Business Builder. This is a no cost database that allows you to find demographic information about your customers. Census 
stats about business and businesses in your industry and estimates of yearly household expenditures. And that's, I think if there's anything you visit today that would be helpful to you, it's the Census Business Builder. And the last link is for the Middle Real Grande Economic, uh, Middle Real Grande Council of Governments Interactive Traffic Counts Map. This allows you to enter an address and see the average weekday and average weekly traffic count for a stretch of road. And I might, uh, if you have more questions about that one, put them in the Q&A and I'll demonstrate that one for you. But I wanna demonstrate Census Business Builder for you. So there's two types of Census Business Builders. There's a small business edition and the regional analyst edition. If you are in a rural area like Los Unis Belen, we have one zip code in those areas. The small business edition would be best for you. If you're in a more urban area, um, Las Cruces, um, Farmington, Albuquerque, Santa Fe, the regional analyst edition might be good for you. We'll use the small business edition today. And the, the information in this database is um, organized by NAICS codes. And what NAICS stands for is North American Industry Classification System. And these are five digit codes that are uh, that group industry, group businesses by industry. So for example, they have some quick links up here. Food service is grouped into bakeries, caterers, food contractors, restaurants, fast food, buffets. And these all have NAICS codes associated with them. I think they're all the same NAICS code. If you have a specific business, we could always look that up. Let me tell you, unless there's a hundred or more businesses that report, you're not gonna get that much business info, but you'll get information about your area for sure. Uh, for this example, we're gonna use fast food because there's a lot of data, a lot of fast food restaurants about. And we could go by state, county, city, town, or zip code. Um, I like to go by, City, town, I also like to go by zip code. Um, for those of you on the call, there's a lot of opportunity in the zip code 87120, which is Southwest Albuquerque. Um, they just built that movie theater where you could drink. <laughs> and uh, there's not a lot of businesses in that area. So that's a high income area with uh, not many businesses, especially small businesses. You could go to a map and you could explore the map. So if I was going to I'm going to explore New Mex a, a more general topic like New Mexico, I might want to go to that map and I could see um, where there are people with household incomes above 50,000. I could see where people, uh, uh, what, where, what parts of New Mexico people spend more on, on topics like eating out for dinner, eating out for lunch, uh, expenditure on alcohol away from the home. I like to look straight at the report because I'm a more uh, read it and learn type person. And if you're dealing with a smaller area, it's, it's, the map's not gonna be that great. It's better for the larger areas, areas with more than one zip code. So this is building my report for 87120. I should have used a zip code in my service area. Maybe next time I will. Gives you information about the population. So if I was marketing, oh, there's more females in that, part, in that area, wow under 18, let's see, over 21. There's not that many old people in that area. So if I was, uh, or older people, more mature people, I wouldn't want to market something catered to the, the older crowd in that area. Median age is 36.9. Interesting to know, especially uh, if I have products geared towards that age group. Gives you some racial breakdown. If I wanted to market something geared towards the Asian population, that would not be the zip code for me to go into. Median household income, and if you know, if uh, like me, I I must a uh, data person. I know that the median household income in the United States is around fifty thousand. So the people in this zip code are are above the median household income. So that says that's a great place to open a storefront. It's a great place to open a restaurant great place to open a place for people where anything that's driven on consumer spending gives you uh, in information about household size, average employed, speaking uh, foreign born, speaking different languages, percent using public transportation, that's a great one. So if I had a, 
an area where people used a lot of public transportation, well, I might want to consider uh, putting maybe a car rental type place there. Maybe uh, one of those bike rental, scooter rental things. Tells you how many housing units there are. So this is the housing characteristics. This is for my tradespeople on the call, my plumbers, uh, electricians, and whatnot. You want to see how much the the price of an owner occupied housing unit is. They have a higher the the higher the housing the higher the housing unit is, probably the more they're going to use your service. Pretty new structures. Maybe I want to if I'm a plumber, I want to go to. A, Places with uh, like Berlin, where where things were built uh, before the the 1980s. Medium rent, so it looks like it's mm, similar to rent and buy. I'd probably want to rent in that area. That might be a great area to put a um, uh, apartment complex. Just saying, La West Side of Los Unas. Just saying, gives you the number of employer establishments you have there, population per employer. So there's 20,000 people for every fast food restaurant in that zip code. That's opportunity right there. And then my favorite part of this is the consumer spending. So if I was gonna do a food truck, if I was gonna do a restaurant, um, I might wanna see how much is spent on beer consumed away from the home, wine consumed away from the home, dining out lunch, dining out breakfast, dining out dinner, and they do have high expenditures in this area. Footwear. I always laugh because the we don't have almost any retail outlets on the east side of Los Unas, and we have about the same amount of expenditure in that area on footwear. So if you sell shoes, especially women's shoes, you might want to locate to this area or the uh, far east side of Los Unas. And you could explore these on the map. You could, If you're going to open up a PC repair place, you might want to see where the highest expenditure on PC repair is. They have water, phone service, whatnot. This is this is probably the the best area for you to consider a new market. So if you were looking for some place that spent a lot of money or some, where the people spent a lot of money, and this is per household, per year, on men's apparel. Ah, look, that's a look at that women's apparel. That's a huge number, um, and that represents a lot of opportunity in that area. You could also take the amount of households they have. So. Um, you could look that up on another database. It's called um, Census Guided Search. And I'll just do this example for you because I think it's very important, especially if you're going to use our business plan. This used to be called American Fact Finder, but they changed it to Census Guided Search. Of course, I knew how to use American Fact Finder. There it is. But the guided search is just as easy. Oh, I'm not having any luck today, you guys, with that guided search. Let's just go to the Fact Finder. We're going to find old data. Take your word, take my word for it, guys. And if you need help with um, finding these the number of uh, households in your area, just email me and I'll get it for you. You could also contact the Bureau of Business and Economic Research at UNM, and they're a free service that will help you with things like that. Let's see what other research tools. Let's look at uh, refer the IBIS world because for those of you starting a business, you want want to know how your industry is doing before you get into it, of course. And uh, IBIS World are reports put together by economists. Let me get rid of some of this stuff. And they give you an idea of how the industry is going to do over the next five years. I like to use the university library's login, but all the SPDCs throughout the state have their own login. If you are a UNM student right now, you have access to this. UNM staff, faculty, student. And we are going to use food trucks. 
because there are a lot there's a lot of information about food trucks if you're a more specialized industry there's not that much um information for you so let's see here So I like to view the PDF, and I, uh, if you consult with us, we'll of course send you this PDF. Let me make this a bit bigger. And I'll go over the, the key data in here with you guys today on food trucks. So the first part is the supply chain and the economic work. Uh, external drivers. So this business is uh, governed by consumer spending. The more consumer spending, the better food trucks do. Consumer confidence index, how people think the economy is going to do over time. Healthy eating index, I'm guessing as people eat less healthy, this, this uh, food trucks do better. Urban population, so as urban population goes up, food trucks are better. Probably because real estate's very expensive in urban areas and food trucks are, are better to serve that area, more flexible and agricultural price index so the cost of food. It also gives you your suppliers and your first tier buyers. Some industries have first tier and second tier buyers. So these are industries like say you make candles, uh, your first tier buyers are not gonna be consumers, they're gonna be businesses. So they're gonna be gift shops um, and stationary shops, stuff like that. This is the industry at a glance. It'll tell you which, which of your drivers are growing or declining. It'll give you information about revenue. So revenues uh, slated to grow uh, a little bit between 2020 and 2025. There's that V-shaped recovery we hear about in the news. Profit margin. So you're making about four cents out of every dollar in revenue for this industry. So that means you're not, uh, you're selling in, quickly and in quantity. The number of businesses is projected to grow in this industry, 5.3% over the next five years. Uh, annual growth of employment is going to grow 4.4%, and annual growth in wages is going to grow 4.1%, probably because of the change in minimum wage. Product and service segmentation. So these are the, the businesses, these are the products that most businesses serve across the United States. So in food trucks, American food is the winner there. Gives you a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Shows you how the industry's performed over the years. If I could, there's a little bit of a lag, so if I could get it right on, I will show it to you. There's that V-shaped recovery we hear a lot about. So it looks like everything tanked in 2020, COVID, was the culprit for that, but it looks like it's going to bounce back to where it was, almost where it was in the food truck industry uh, in 2021 and 2022. So that that shows you if there's opportunity or maybe something you might want to, or maybe a business you may not want to consider because it's going to decline rapidly. And then a, a many of these reports show you where the business life cycle is. So food trucks are in quantity growth. That means they're, the industry is going to grow as a whole. More food trucks are going to pop up. And when um, a business is in the growth phase, it's the best time to enter the business. There's the product and service segmentation. And here's the major market. So if you're going to do any sort of marketing, if you're a food truck, you're going, your, your target market's consumers age 25 to 44. And that is where you want to spend your money. And we talk more about target markets in the e-commerce webinar and, and the marketing webinars. And then uh, one of my favorite parts of this is the cost structures. So this could help you see how much profit you might make in the business. So profit, as we saw, was 4%. Where's our profit here? This little red sliver. So if I plan to make $100,000 at this food truck, 
um, four thousand dollars would be profit to the business, and that's not uh, it's not entirely profitable. Uh, so if I wanted to go into a high profitable high profit industry, I might consider consulting. Service providers often have a higher uh, profit margin. And that's Ibis World in a nutshell. Re I wanted to talk to you about Reference USA, but I want to leave time for question and answer. Question and answers. So Reference USA is now Data Excel, and that's a database with, that I that you could use to find um, the addresses, phone numbers, emails. You can't legally email uh, somebody or call them unless you have uh, their unless you buy the list you could find out where people women who ha are in households of a hundred thousand plus per year uh in albuquerque new mexico you could find where the largest amount of those people are so you could find maybe a place to locate if i was going to park a food truck i might want to look for those areas with a large population between 35 and 44. and the traffic counts is also a great way to find locations. You could find uh, how many people are passing that stretch of road a day. If I was gonna do a food truck, if I was gonna do a pop-up shop, if I was gonna select a location for my business and it, it's governed by people traveling by, people passing my business, a laundromat, check and go restaurant, I might wanna check the New Mexico uh, COG website for that. Perfect. And if you want to learn more about the research tools, put it in the Q&A, and I'm happy to go over those. I could do a whole webinar and just those. I'm sure. Now that we talked about how we could help you, this is how you could help the SBDC. As part of offering our services, we need your help to ensure our services are around for many more years to come. So we ask that you participate in our surveys, report economic impacts because of our assistance, and that's to your advisor or to your um, center director and write a letter of support to your local legislators about your experience with the SBDC. All information is kept confidential and is only reported in aggregate to our funders, the state of New Mexico and the Small Business Administration. I wanna go over some uh, of our SBDC programs with you. This slide provides contact information for our SBDC programs, PTAC, IBA and the New Mexico TCA. The Procurement Technical Assistance Center is a government funded program providing assistance to small businesses who want to sell their goods or services to the government, educational institutions, or tribal entities. The International Business Accelerator is a one stop shop of resources for New Mexican businesses and individuals wishing to introduce their product or service into a global market. And the New Mexico Technology Commercialization Accelerator offers no cost confidential consulting regarding intellectual property. Let's look at our resource partners. This slide continues the list of small business resource partners, the uh, Service Corps of Retired Executives, or SCORE, WEST, which is the Women's Business Center Program, and VBOC, which is the Veterans Business Outreach Center. And uh, if you're a veteran, definitely contact VBOC. They offer a great um, training course called From Boots to Business, and it's like a mini MBA. West is also a, a micro lender. So, and they serve both men and women. And another cool thing that they've done recently is they have a um, studio sponsored by Comcast where you could film commercials, you could rent the space, you could film vlogs, uh, you could get technical assistance. It's a really neat center. And then here's contact information for your small business support team. We are funded by the Small Business Administration. We are not the Small Business Administration. And many people ask about small SBA loans. Uh, th so the SBA doesn't lend directly. They offer loan guarantees to banks. So they're like Rick, Rich Uncle Sam co-signing for you on a loan. And uh, here's the SBA resource guide. If you have any questions about their lending programs, they're all outlined in the resource guide. And remember, all these links will be sent to you, so don't worry. And on page 27 of this guide are all the SBA uh, participating lenders. 
And for those of you wanting to start a business out right now, a lot of the banks will not um, finance a new business. They want to. They only want to finance credit lines for existing businesses because that's less risky for them. The people willing to take the risks are the uh, participating certified development companies. That's if you're wanting to grow a business. The community advantage lender. None, they, these are all nonprofit lenders. DreamSpring. They are also a micro lender. The loan fund is one of the more common micro lenders in the state. And West, of course, I mentioned they are a micro lender. Uh, so these are loans under $50,000. And they work with people with blemish credit. They work with people with no credit. Uh, they're, they're, they're really apt to finance you, especially if you're passionate about your small business. But of course, you're going to need a business plan and a set of financial projections before you get into that lending process. Oh, and I want to thank you guys. We, we fi finished a little early, and since this is a COVID webinar, I, didn't, I did not put my COVID slide in here, but I have my COVID slides on another presentation, and I could include these uh, in the follow-up email for you. Let me open up those COVID slides. This slide is not infected with COVID. These are actually the COVID-19 resources for small business. And I will I will go ahead and email this to you. And I just wanna go over the top um, five resources, one, two, three, four, five, six resources that I have for learning more about COVID safe practices in business. So the first one is a link to the New Mexico Department of Health's COVID safe practices for employers. And these are the legit links, guys. There's a lot of fraud going on. There's a lot of not so nice things happening. So I will always give you the, the safest links. So don't worry. The next one is for the New Mexico Safe Certified Program. And if you run a restaurant or hospitality type business, these are learning modules put together by uh, the New Mexico Tourism Task Force, and they help people get ready to serve, uh, certified to serve uh, people during COVID-19. Uh, I believe the capacity of your restaurant, you could serve more people if you are certified. They also give you a great little um, uh, ad credit to New Mexico, the magazine. Uh, so if you wanted to take out an ad in that magazine, I think it's like a $400 credit. So that might save you, you know, 50, a uh, 25%, 50% on that ad. And it's a really cool, nice looking website. You know, leave it to the, the people, the marketers for the state of New Mexico to put together a good website. And then you could also find, I, I, that's a little bit of a, a guilt trip right there in my opinion, but you could find businesses that are safe certified. Let me go back to that slide, the slides. Then we have OSHA's guidance on preparing workplaces for COVID-19. That's a big publication, it's like 70 pages. Uh, take a look at that if you are one of those who have a lot of physical presence in your business. This is the uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention's guide about coronavirus. This is the, my favorite link. This is what you should know. So if you're an employer or you're bringing in people to your business and you wanna know, about some of the laws associated with um, um, COVID-19 restrictions. Read this article, it's by the EEOC. And, it, and it uh, one of my favorite parts of it is it, tell, it answers questions about, can I ask my employees if they had COVID-19, if they have COVID-19, can I make them get a, a COVID-19 vaccination? This will answer those questions for you. And then of course, our New Mexico.gov website, which will give you uh, information about COVID-19 lending programs, financing programs, and anything available to you about from the state or the federal government regarding COVID-19 assistance. Some of the tax credits available to you. So I wanted to give you that information about COVID since this is a COVID-19 webinar. I'll go back to that last page. 
And I want to thank you for spending time with me today. And I'm going to get into that Q&A. And I see something in the chat. OK. How does how does licenses how do licenses work from home for home based businesses? Oh, that's a good question, Heather. So let's see if we could go back to that slide about business structure business structures. So, so let's So when you're choosing a business structure, it really doesn't matter if you have a physical uh, storefront or you're doing business from home. Some municipalities and counties will have a special business license for those uh, they call um, cottage industry doing business at home. But um, it's best to consult with somebody who knows a lot, little bit about the legal structures of a business because if you're doing business from home, you might take on a little bit more liability you might take on less liability, or um, it might not be the best structure for you tax-wise. So basically, these, these tax structures are governed by the amount of liability you have in a business and the way in which you want to file your tax return. Um, for a home-based business, could be any of these. They could be a sole proprietor. They could be a corporation. Um, but in the state of New Mexico, whenever you incorporate a business, you have to have both a mailing address and a physical address. And if you have a physical address, say, you know, where I live, I might not want that shown on the Secretary of State's website. And I indeed could look up any business and see what their physical and mailing address is on this website. So if, uh, just a bit of advice for my home-based small businesses. If you want to start a business in your home base, there's some alternatives for you to not use that physical address uh, in your corporate documents. You could go to some place like alternative uh, alternative offices in Albuquerque, and they could give you a virtual office with a, a mail forwarding address. You could rent an office space, of course. You could uh, go to a um, a mail provider like uh, the UPS store, and they provide you with a physical address. That's a gray area. That's uh, I'm not giving legal advice now, but uh, I have seen it go the, get the paperwork pushed through. You could go to some place like the South Valley Business Incubator in Albuquerque, and they offer um, a virtual office um, subsidy program. So they they contract get you a virtual office space, and they only charge you a hundred bucks a year. If you were to do this um, on your own, it probably cost you more than a hundred bucks a year. And that's a shout out for our our uh, business incubator down there. So thank you for asking that, Heather. There's not much of a difference for those who want to work out of their home, other than the form they might fill out. Um, but all you're under, you're obligated under all the same laws uh, as a normal business would be. And Heather asks, can you use this without being part of UNM? If it's one of those databases that I showed you, let me go back to that slide. That's at the bottom of the page. So that would be IBIS World, Reference USA, which is now Data Excel, Demographics Now, and then I people uh, centers at UNM have access to that Mintel marketing reports, which I love. Uh, you, they they pay for these. Uh, they're very expensive databases. If you were to uh, get something from IBIS World, it costs you uh, more eight hundred dollars and up. If you wanted to buy a list of um, potential customers from Reference USA. It costs one thousand dollars for five thousand contacts. So these are databases we pay for. So make an appointment with your business advisor or your SBDC staff, and we could help you uh, get information from those paid uh, resources. The ones I have listed from one to four here, these are all free, and you have access to them straight from the websites that I have on the slides. Good question. Thank you, Heather. Patrick asks, what websites did you say to go to to get stats on uh, or demographics on the industry? I'm interested in from my area. Um, and you could log into the NMSU database. I, I know I spent some time with an NMSU SBDC and they have some of these databases available to them, the IBIS world. 
I know they have for sure. Um, and that would be through the NMSU library. The one, the one I showed you about the demographics for that area is Census Business Builder. It's number three on the list of the, on the slides, and that's available to you for free. So to answer your question, Patrick, it's Census Business Builder. Let's see, John's S21 Ultra. To obtain the EIN and register uh, register for New Mexico licenses, is there a charge and expiration date on the licenses? So very good question. There is, so there's no charge for the EIN. So the employer identification number is a free is free from the IRS. And that's mainly used to track and pay your uh, employment taxes. If you're a sole proprietor or doing business as a sole proprietor, you'd use that on your federal filings and for a bank account. You are charged a yearly fee for your uh, municipal or county business license. So if I'm in Los Unas, I think I pay $25 a year if I'm in Valencia County, I believe they charge $45 a year and they're usually renewed in March. So some municipalities like in Bosque Farms, if you're renewing in January, they will charge you $45 and then you'll have to renew again in March anyway. So it's kind of a money-making thing for them. But yeah, there is a, a they're usually done yearly. Um, temporary uh, lasts for a week, I believe then you could get them renewed on a week. If somebody comes selling magazines to your door, like they do to my my door occasionally, they usually have a little uh, lanyard with their uh, temporary business license in it. So that means that they're able to go door to door. Let's see the next question. Art asks, can I view this presentation in the uh, at my convenience in the future? Yes, I will send you a PDF of this presentation. I do. We are recording it, but we are not distributing the recordings quite yet. Um, the SBDC plans to put the recordings on demand. We are still testing out our uh, software for that. So we might not have that available in the near future, but we will eventually have these recorded and on demand. Patrick says, thank you. Well, thank you very much for spending time with me today. Let's see what might be in the chat. What is the business license process for home-based businesses? Do they work exactly the same as store locations, costs, et cetera? That's a great question, Heather. In fact, the um, community development manager in Los Unidos put out an uh, ad in the paper reminding every, or not an ad, but an information in the paper reminding everybody in Los Unidos that no matter if you're a multinational corporation like Facebook or you're a home-based business, you pay the same amount for a business license and they work exactly the same. So the only, the, the only things that work differently are the corporate structures, which we talked about earlier. That's uh, the LLCs, general partnerships and whatnot. Those you would get tax or legal advice from an attorney or an accountant, and they would be able to guide you to the best structure for you. But business licenses work the same for Facebook as they would work for you in your home. And let's see, okay. They will, so if you, uh, uh, follow up from Heather, do they require an inspection? So if you had a storefront, you would have to get that inspected by uh, the fire department. If you are a home-based business and you're uh, working out of a residential, um, home you can't have they won't give you a business license if you're going to have people visiting the home you would have to get what they call a conditional use of the property and it's a it's kind of a drawn out process you have to send uh, ballots to people in your neighborhood they have to approve whether or not they want to let you uh, use that uh, residential house as a commercial piece of property you have to go in front of the council so you gotta cross your fingers and hope you didn't piss off one of the council members uh, in your past. So uh, uh, you and, and then you would have to get a, a, an inspection. Sometimes people want to operate a commercial kitchen or a commissary out of their home. That is possible, but you would have to get that conditional use of the home and then you'd have to get special inspections from the uh, New Mexico Environment Department. So that is a tricky one, Heather, but it can be done. Uh, the best thing to do if you want to operate a business out of your home is to find a piece of property. So working with a real estate agent that is in a commercial overlay 
or is already zoned uh, multi-use. And uh, I see a lot of this on in um, places like Albuquerque on the southeast side of town. So we're thinking Wyoming and Central. There's a lot of property uh, zoned there for mixed use. So I see a lot of people renting um, auto shops out of their home there um, and more industrial type things. Uh, I know down South Broadway, there's a lot of those old historic homes in Albuquerque and a lot of them are zoned commercial as well. But it's, it, that's a tricky business. That's you having a good relationship with your municipal or county offices and uh, making sure you didn't piss off your neighbors because my neighbor three doors down wanted to operate a business out of her home. She wanted to have people come to her business. She's a consultant and <laughs> the neighborhood did not like that idea very much at all. So she, she went through that expense and did not get that conditional zone. And I think she's still bitter about it because she still doesn't bring it up. <laughs> but if you're not going to have people going to your home, you're not going to have a sign up in front of your home, uh, you shouldn't have any problems getting a business license. So the ideal candidate for that would be maybe um, somebody like Chris who does uh, who uh, does a lot of data, data analysis. I could do that over the um, Zoom like we're doing now. If I'm a consultant, maybe an, I'm an HR consultant, I could do a lot of that over Zoom. Um, I could also visit your business instead of you visiting my home. Um, but yeah, when you have people setting foot on your property or you're putting up a sign, uh, you will have issues getting that uh, license. Drawn out explanation for a simple question. And I have seven minutes with you all. So I'm, I'm gonna stay on the line. I'm gonna look for questions. I'm at your we disposal. Have, Chris, we have a hand raised. I don't know. Um, let's look like... at the participants. Okay. So I see that's Chris. Let's allow Chris to speak. So Chris, you are muted, but you are allowed to speak. And if you want to ask a question, you go right ahead. I'm going to open that opportunity up to everybody else. So if you do have a question and you want to speak, please raise your hand and I will allow you to speak. And I see Chris, you you put your hand down. So I'm going to um, not give you permission to speak anymore. And <laughs> let, let anybody else on the line, if you want to speak a question, go right ahead. In the meantime, I am going to allow, if I see anybody from our our internal network. I'm going to allow them to speak and shout out their center. And we do have another hand raised. Oh, yeah. that's a, okay. Let's allow you to talk. So that's Johnny's the Johnny. I'm I'm guessing. Yes, Johnny. Hi, Johnny. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, is there any information I really need to uh, try to? my products can be sold online. Um, I probably need some type of uh, access so, to, uh, you know, some type of program that's going to help me with that. Uh, do you know where I can go from there? Perfect. Well, thank you for asking, Johnny. So with thank things you. like narcotics, medical cannabis, uh, hemp, things like that, the SPDC cannot consult because those are still considered illegal by um, the federal government, and we are funded by the feds. But any information about selling uh, controlled substances online can be found at the FDA's website. And the FDA, the Federal Food and Drug Administration, they also govern the sale of cosmetics. So if you made homemade chapsticks, homemade lotions, and you wanted to sell those maybe to a grocery store, they would have that information for you. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for asking that. We do have a webinar coming up and uh, tomorrow at 12, important legal considerations for selling online. Leslie, do you want to share those upcoming webinars with us? I'll stop yeah. sharing. Okay, right I, okay, I can. Um, so tomorrow at uh, 12, grab your lunch and uh, we have the Larry Donahue, important legal considerations for selling online. On Friday at 12, we have uh, 
Eric Spellman, who is going to be covering e-commerce and disaster recovery, which um, they're both great speakers, great, great presenters. And then um, starting Monday, Larry Donahue is going to be back with us again at 12 for top 10 uh, business mistake, top 10 mistakes businesses make. And that's going to be a two part series Monday and Thursday next week. Then on Tuesday, the 23rd, we are going to have the secret to adding online revenue streams. So there's, it's going to be really kind of packed the next, this week and next week with the um, all this valuable information. Oh, that's great. And and I really like the way you, did you mention the legal considerations that are on February 18th? Yes, that's going to be coming up tomorrow. Tomorrow. So yeah, Johnny, try to take that webinar and ask, uh, ask any specific questions you might have to the attorney there. Because uh, we like to really press that. We, we like to give uh, Larry Nana you a hard time. And uh, let's see. The um, If you're a small business and you're wanting to get technical assistance from Sandia National Lab or Los Alamos National Lab, we have this webinar coming up. What is the Small Business Assistance Program? And uh, you could get your questions answered about how you, you as a small business could get that technical assistance. So the, the person who coordinates it, her name is Judy Hendricks at Sandia Labs. She uses the example, if you're doing something in business and you need an electron microscope, they will offer you a grant and time to use that electron microscope. And that will save you probably a million dollars so you don't have to buy your own. We do have um, Heather asking, how do they sign up for those webinars? So. Uh, Chris, could you put it in the uh, chat and then they could just copy it and save it and then they would have access to the page to sign up for any of these webinars? Yes, let me find my Zoom. I've lost it in all my clicking here. <laughs> okay. And then I will chat that over to everybody. And this is, uh, and I'm on it right now. This is the page I'm on right now. It's for our workshops. You just click the workshop that you want to attend. So uh, I'm, since I'm, I'm coordinating the SB, the, what's the Small Business Assistance Program, we'll use that as an example. You go to sign up here in the upper left-hand corner and you either create an account or you log into your current account and you could uh, sign up for those. You could also email uh, either Leslie Everson or I, right? Le we, we do love it when you email us, right, Leslie? Yes, it's fine. <laughs> I'll be glad to send over the links to any of the webinars and uh, uh, the webinars that we talked about um, today are all the no cost webinars. So um, just sign up, go to however many you like. We'd love to have you there. And if you have any questions, uh, email me and I'll pass it along to the presenter. And that's my, my lovely British clock telling me it's one o'clock. And uh, I want to thank everybody on the call with for spending time with me today. I want to thank Leslie and Annalena for being such good coordinators of these webinars. And if you have any further questions for me, you have my email address. You could expect that follow up email. And I will see all of you soon. And I hope you have uh, wish you good luck in your business ventures. Bye.